Thank you everyone for being here and thank you Kapas for all of your support and for the opportunity to present my work. Stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Central Asian Plateau, the region of the Middle East and North Africa is largely dominated by arid lands which have brought about distinct forms of societal organization, political order, and man-made settlements. In response to the limitations of desert life, these developments did not emerge devoid of complications. The struggles for survival in the desert demanded the invention of complex sustainable design forms or constant seasonal migration. Historians have argued that arid lands often gave colonial and pseudo-colonial powers a ploy to justify their occupations of the desert, including those of the MENA region, in ecological terms. Colonial powers frequently viewed deserts as devastating areas in need of renewal and repair. The failure of the native population to sustain fertile areas and to make the best of natural resources available to them was, for example, highlighted with the U.S. Department of the Interior broad aid to the Middle East through such public programs as the Point Four and the Tennessee Valley Authority, as well as private interests such as the Development and Resource Corporation led by David Lilienthal, who was um, the head of TVA, uh, but also, according to his biography, his uh, most successful achievements were in Iran from roughly from the 1950s to the end of the 1970s. These public and private entities would build dams across the region's major rivers and by doing so eliminate centuries-old sustainable local methods of careful management of water such as the qanat or underground tunnel systems that brought water to the Earth's surface using only gravitational forces. The hierarchies of technical ability laid foundations for an ideology that would prominence in all U.S. initiatives, including the Point Four program's quote-unquote resource primitivism, which upheld that primitive people misunderstood and undervalued their own resources and needed constant supervision. I am quoting Megan Black from this book, in which she goes on to say, quote, Resource primitivism revived the age-old colonial logic that insisted that primitive people fail to value and tend land properly and should therefore be dispossessed of it, end quote. By the mid-20th century, such environmentally friendly tuned architecture as the basket homes of Iraq's marshlands and the wind towers of the Persian Gulf states and Iran were on the verge of extinction. And this gradual disappearance affected the region's environmental management negatively. For example, as evident through the reports of the Development and Resource Corporation program housed at Princeton University's Library's Special Collections, which I had the honor to, um, uh, to study um, this past September, the modern irrigation canals that replaced the ancient Ganat system completely cut across older canals and interrupted access to water for many small villagers. Early technical issues emerged with the dam projects. As early as 1971, siltation, for example, attributed to land mismanagement posed threats. Addressing this necessitated new watershed stabilization efforts. However, deeper flaws existed in the development strategy, prioritizing large-scale agribusiness and disrupting regional life, the experts imposed a top-down hierarchy, sidelining local frameworks. Many of these locals were relocated to model villages and poorly designed homes, which heightened local dissatisfaction. And I found this quote in the archive. I thought you might be interested to know, you can build a dam every day, but it takes longer, much longer, to create the mentality that really likes the dam. And now you know why. That the local design culture was inadequate for modernity was a sentiment reflected in native literature, such as Abul Ghassam Kermani's Rostam in the 22nd century from 1934. This early Iranian sci-fi depicts Rostam, who's a hero from the Persian epic Shahnameh, or the Book of King, um, Book of Kings, um, think of it as Homer's Iliad, for example, um, for the Persian uh, world. 
struggling to understand 22nd century technology. The story might have drawn inspiration from the global sci-fi icon Buck Rogers created by Philip Francis Nolan in 1928, yet Kermani's portrayal differs in its representation of Rostam as overwhelmed by modern tools. Iranians in the 1930s would have been astonished to learn that just a few decades later, their own methods of design and life would become a model for envisioning the future of humanity. This became particularly evident in the years leading up to the notorious energy crisis of the 1920s, but only in the realm of science fiction rather than actual work. During the Cold War, the threat of nuclear bomb instilled a pervasive fear of a desert-like future in the United States. The relentless portrayal of real nuclear explo explosions and the simulated destruction of suburban American cities broadcast nationally in real time unwittingly reshaped perceptions of the future. These vivid depictions, which, uh, while reinforcing the normalization of militarization, inadvertently perhaps etched the image of a desert-like future into the collective psyche. Anthropologist Joseph Masco has noted that the goal was to seamlessly integrate the concept of nuclear war into the framework of nation building. Consequently, the iconography of desolate landscapes came to symbolize the acceptance of both militarization within the society and a kind of vision for the future. Thus, the desert, with its eerie allure and juxtaposition of hope and fear, became intertwined with futuristic visions. Unsurprisingly, such a vision also relied, and I'm quoting Masco, on the very practices of erasure that informed the foundational American logics of indigenous dispossession, constituting a pristine nature only through violent removal. Within this political landscape, science fiction authors and filmmakers were naturally captivated by the desert, viewing it not only as a symbol of potentially apocalyptic future, but also a train that held the premise of humanity's survival against all odds. Notably, Ray Bradbury's 1950s book, The Martian Chronicles, depicted desert-like landscapes with a quote-unquote thin atmosphere, which humans could breathe. The images that accompanied these tales, whether through printed materials or moving pictures, were driven from the built landscapes of the desert of the MENA region, and the series are all infused with colonial themes. Another instance of an arid desert world serving as a science fiction backdrop is Frank Herbert's 1965 novel, Dune and its film adaptations in 1984, I'm sure many of you know that, by David Lynch, and 2021, I'm sure many of you have seen it more recently, the desert planet Arrakis, reminiscent of arid earth deserts, is the only resource of the invaluable spice, a driver for space exploration and the interstellar analog of Earth's petroleum. This spite ignites conflicts among the powerful houses of the Imperium, paralleling our petroleum-driven disputes. The movie's adaptation, directed by Denis Villeneuve, was shot in Jordan's Wadi Room, echoing the same setting as Lawrence of Arabia. Similarly, both narratives feature a white savior protagonist. In Dune, Paul Atreides, portrayed by Timothy Chalamet, is ascribed Arabic honorifics like Lisan al Ghaib or Mahdi. The Freeman natives of Arrakis, descendants of the Zen Sunni wanderers inspired by Zen Buddhism and Sunni Islam, revere water through their beliefs with sacred phrases like, quote, bless the maker and all his water. They rely on a steel suit suits to conserve moisture and survive in the desert. Perhaps the steel suit here is meant to be a more sophisticated form of traditional Arabian desert costumes such as the qamis. 
Design strategies for survival in the desert are likewise portrayed in other cinematic representations of life in the face of a scarcity of natural resources. Perhaps most famously, a Tunisian Berber village became Tatooine, the iconic backdrop for the original Star Wars films, which I had the privilege of visiting more recently. Here, I must also mention that um, there, there are debates uh, uh, over whether the Star Wars series qualifies as a science fiction or, as a, or a fantasy. However, by adhering to the film's central theme, which I'm sure many of you know, in a galaxy far, far away, etc., one can speculate that the light from a civilization in another galaxy might not reach us until millions of years after their existence has passed. In this sense, we can consider Star Wars a narrative that pertains to the future. The desert of Chateau Jarid, famously known as the location of Lars Homestead in Star Wars Saga, um, was the same arid landscape once traversed by the German army under the command of General Erwin Rommel, otherwise known as the Desert Fox. It is plausible that the imagery from these historical battles captivated the attention of George Lucas, along with, with his production supervisor, Robert Watts, and producer, Gary Kutz, when they were searching for a suitable location to depict the home planets of their protagonists. Their quest was aided by a Franco-Tunisian mogul, who was at the time very young um, filmmaker, Tarek Ben Ammar, who oversaw the, film shoot, the film's shoot. Recalling those days, Ammar remarked, George needed a desert that could pass for an alien planet not too far from Europe. That was the allure of Tunisia. Keep in mind, George did not have an abundance of funds to produce the film. We had no inkling of how monumental the film would become. No one did. Also note that um, these are uh, food storage houses. Um, probably we can follow, call them uh, medieval um, refrigerators um, that, are, that you can find all over North Africa. But in the film, uh, specifically in the version from the late 1990s, they're presented as homes. Borrowing heavily from both Herbert and Lean, George Lucas set the opening of the scenes of the films on a critically dry desert planet. In the film, settlers must rely upon moisture farming to extract water from the arid atmosphere. The desert also has its own mysterious native tribe of sandmen. So like the freemen of Dune, the sandmen are portrayed as fierce warriors who are capable of living with minimal technology on the high desert. Importantly, the production of all of these um, fictitious tales with the central theme of the Middle Eastern or North African desert paralleled the American interest in the raw resources of the Middle East. Returning to Dune, again, it is a film about the future of humans on other planets, but it's also one that captures the environmental politics of the Cold War and the socio-political atmosphere of the post-colonial world. Recall that the novel Dune was written only three years after the Algerian liberation. As literary critic Gerard Gaylord in this edited volume has written, imperial and colonial ambitions and science fiction are directly related because, quote, both are concerned with issues of alterity, colonization, power, and empire. Set in motion by colonial ambitions, survival design strategies in the deserts of the Middle East played an important role in the mainstream popular culture of the U.S., particularly during the oil crisis that necessitated relying on fossil fuel energy, fossil fuel free energy. However, these strategies were dismissed by major actors within the scientific communities as well as development experts. The early accounts of space exploration attest to this. The history of early space exploration is deeply intertwined with Cold War geopolitics. Milestone events during the 1960s and 70s catalyzed scientists, engineers, and architects to draft ambitious plans for lunar explorations and beyond. These endeavors were propelled by the Soviet and NASA missions, beginning with the first human space launch in 1961 and culminating with the 1969 moon landing. Within a decade, the cosmic frontier was unlocked for human expeditions. The requisite infra 
infrastructure for these missions was immense, encompassing launch vehicles, computers, radar systems, and biomedical technology. Notably, these innovations emerged before the semiconductor boom of the 1970s. So this meant that NASA, as well as the Soviets perhaps, had to pioneer much of the required technology explicitly for space goals, incurring hefty expenses. Despite these challenges, both nations heavily financed their space endeavors. For a perspective, NASA's budget in 1966 was 4.5% of the US federal budget, whereas in 2019, it was less than 0.5% of that federal budget. As granted as these funded programs were, establishing lasting lunar bases such as this one would have demanded even greater financial commitments. Such heavy expenditures become increasingly, would become increasingly unavailable as the U.S. faced escalating involvement in Vietnam and Cambodia. The financial justification for space exploration shifted after the 1973 oil crisis. In this evolving landscape, Princeton physicist Gerard O'Neill proposed building vast space colonies known as O'Neill cylinders. Reacting to the difficulty of life on Earth, he envisioned constructing immense artificial cylinders in Earth's orbit that would also harness and transmit solar energy back to Earth. However, O'Neill's ambitious ideas struggled to find a firm economic grounding. So whether backed by the scientific claims or by the pop culture of the Apollo era, most ambitious plans for lunar settlements were ultimately economically unviable. They were also hunted, architectural historian Felicity Scott argues, quote, by the legacy of settler colonialism and its violent and inequitable modes of governance, end quote. It is against this backdrop that the ideas of Iranian-American architect Nader Khalili, who, left, who lived from 1936 to 2008, stand out. By the way, here by regolith, I mean um, the stuff of lunar surfaces. Think of it as sand of the desert. In the 1970s, Khalili abandoned his lucrative design business in Los Angeles and returned home for a five-year research odyssey amidst Iran's vernacular settlements. Soon after, Khalili embarked on a new design project. Using clay, water, and fire, he invented the Geltov dance system, a renewed approach to conventional methods of kiln firing. And please note that his work is to upgrade and improve traditional methods of building. In other words, he's not just nostalgic about the past, wanting to bring all of the traditional building methods to the 20th century, but he wants to study them carefully and improve them for the modern age. He sought to improve, as I said, the structural weaknesses of existing adobe architecture by enhancing their uh, resistance to earthquake. Khalili's work in Iran result, resulted in a series of building projects, including these sandbag shelters, a, a different method, that were made cheaply and ecologically, and were particularly apt for the immediate and temporary accommodation of refugees and disaster victims. However, by the architect's own account, in the political atmosphere of the 1970s and early 1980s, the world was more fascinated by the future than the present. So Khalili translated his humanitarian earth architecture into shelters for lunar surfaces. In 1984, at a NASA-sponsored symposium on the future of lunar outposts, Khalili proposed a method for constructing lunar-based structures in situ by using unprocessed or minimally processed lunar regolith. Khalili's paper envisioned melting the lunar regolith at high temperatures to produce a viscous, thick magma. In a later iteration of the paper published in the Journal of Aerospace Engineering in 1989, Khalili considered several renewable energy sources, including solar, possibly converted into microwaves for the actual melt. 
The viscous magma would allow it to flow through molds to form rib members for shell structures. The packing material between the structural rib members would also be produced directly by sintering, which is a process of molding without melting, the lunar regolith to just below the melting point. The process of sintering allows the glass and silicate particles comprising the regolith to become fused into a compact solid. In the absence of an atmosphere, all lunar settlements will require a minimum of two meters of compacted regolith over all habitats to protect against the potentially deadly long-term exposure to cosmic rays. Khalili noted that this sintered regolith packing material would provide a sufficient safety buffer in less space than packed regolith. The process of melting and sintering of the lunar regolith, which Khalili envisioned, have been explored in depth only in recent years. Khalili also proposed that magma could be thrown on a centrifugally gyrating platform. Careful regulation of heat applied to melt would allow the lunar material to be shaped into any form desired while working to economical and technical advantages by using primarily local resources. The resulting compo components could be brought together into a grand regolith settlement in the form of a circular structure with radiating apses, resembling the floor plans of Persian adobe ice storage houses, which you saw in the last style or slide, or pigeon towers, which you can see here in this slide. Also included in, 1989, in the 1989 article is an architectural detail from a 19th century house um, in the central desert of Iran. Khalili suggests the form of this particular structure as a jumping off point for casting similar forms in situ with generated magma. In particular, Khalili underlines the significance of the free form of such a structures that could be sculpted effortlessly and ultimately approach, quote, hyperbolic, paraboloid shell structures without reinforcing tensile members, end quote. But Khalili's proposed project is far from a nostalgic and romanticized or even nationalistic urge apropos his homeland, Iran. In fact, he omitted any references to Iran, and, and I guess perhaps it was because of the hostage crisis um, in the early 1980s. Perhaps the most prescient suggestion in Khalili's 1989 paper was to use terrestrial lava tubes as a model to learn, to lean, to learn from and to prototype his concepts for lunar settlements. He pointed to Idaho's Craters of the Moon National Monument as a study site to understand how these barren geological formations can eventually support plant life. This approach suggested possible agricultural solutions for Moon and Mars settlements. Although Martian lava tubes were observed in 1972, lunar counterparts were only discovered in 2009, which is shortly after Khalili's death. These tubes, as large as cities due to weaker lunar and Martian gravities, are now considered potential sites for the first human settlements, which um, with places like the Resilient Extraterrestrial Habitats Institute actively exploring them. Khalili's sustainable and ecologically minded proposal was in stark contrast with proposals set forth at the same panel by contemporaneous construction experts. Noteworthy is a proposed project by a representative from the Portland Cement Company for setting up a cement factory on the moon to build three-story office building types. By all accounts, Khalili's humble yet efficient proposal was ahead of his time. Khalili's, Khalili's thinking was very much in line with the alternative design projects that came with the countercultural movement in the United States and elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere. Let us recall specifically the energy efficient design proposals that were abundantly depicted not only on popular and friendly books such as this one, but also featured in significant alternative English publications like the Whole Earth Catalog. 
Notably, the 1978 Softec issue of Co-Evolution Quarterly, which is a branch of the whole Earth Catalog, co-edited by Stuart Brand and Jay Baldwin. And by the way, Jay Baldwin was a student of Bucky Fuller, the guy who made the geodesic domes. The term soft was inspired by Amory Levine's 1977 book, Soft Energy Paths. Instead of environmentally harmful hard technologies, Levine's championed soft energy sources like solar, wind, and biomass conversion. Softec further delved into designs and materials that adapt to changing environmental conditions. The issue of um, the co-evolutionary quarterly portrayed soft as traditional building materials like mud or straw mud buildings, highlighting underground settlements in desert-like climates with a focus on Southern Europe and the American Southwest. Brand's introduction describes soft as something that is alive, adaptive, and even lovable. The cover aptly showcases a high-pressure water wheel within a Naqshbandi frame, a floral design form from Persian book illustrations, subtly echoing Middle Eastern influences throughout the volume without actually making them bold. It is, it is also interesting that the Naqshbandi is the name of a um, Sufi sect in the Middle Ages uh, whose path is ironically the same path as the hippie trail in Afghanistan and places like that in Central Asia. Khalili's proposal was also formed against highly celebrated alternative architectural achievements, including uh, those uh, by Paolo Soleri, the Italian-American architect who is the founder of the Cosanti Foundation and Arco Santi in the Arizona desert, which became a testing ground for Soleri's progressive concept of arcology, a postmanteau of architecture and ecology. The concrete buildings were made to withstand harsh desert climates using minimal energy on a minimal carbon footprint. However, as you can see in this image that I took recently, the people who live there, some of them uh, older generation uh, now of the, of the past hippie communities, um, have to use um, ACs in this slide that I took recently. Um, and, um, so I think that some of the claims about the environmental aspects of the project um, um, is not very sound. Uh, but don't take me wrong, I, I absolutely love Paolo Soleri's drawing and his architectural imagination. It's just the environmental part that I'm criticizing, uh, not him as a very talented architect, um, of course. It's worth mentioning that Soleri um, uh, so before I show that, I also wanted to um, show you this book, um, Scenes in America Deserta, by the famous uh, British-American uh, um, architectural historian and architectural critic, Rainer Banham, uh, who actually, when he saw uh, uh, buildings in Las Vegas, he said, the presence of such enclaves in the harsh desert environment is so implausible that only science fiction can manage it. The place is like a compound of an alien race on a on a hostile planet. Um, and it's interesting, he didn't say this about Paula Soleri necessarily, but in the book he actually talks about Paula Soleri's projects as well. Uh, but Paula Soleri's Arcosanti actually became the stage set uh, for the adaptation of Isaac Isimov's Nightfall. Uh, and you can see the film, it's available on Amazon or maybe Netflix. It is worth mentioning that Soleri was also the visionary behind Equiminushi, small ecological pods designed for outer space. Essentially, he extended his, um, uh, his desert-inspired creations to the realm of extraterrestrial habitats, a topic that goes beyond the scope of this presentation, but as depicted in this screenshot, um, the narrative predominantly comprises poetic musings and phrases uh, such as uh, what drives technological man is not comfort nor service, but transcendence. Um, so rather than providing um, technical um, content, um, uh, he's more interested um, in the poetic aspects of that. <clears throat> 
Another prime example in the corpus of ongoing activities around the time when Khalili submitted his NASA pro proposal is the work of system ecologist John Allen, whose discussions with Paula Solari, as well as expeditions, among other things, I mean, he, he traveled all over the world, but his expeditions in the deserts of Iran um, in the 1960s, because he worked for David Lilienthal uh, for the Dev Development and Resource Corporation, gave the emphasis for Arizona's Biosphere 2, an analog for human settlements on the moon or Mars. In his autobiographical book, Alan writes, from the standpoint of surviving crises such as those we faced in southern Iran, I analyzed my key team consultants and biospherian candidates. And I'm just paraphrasing. Biosphere 2's demonstration of the close-knit bond between humanity and all nature would impact at least as many entrenched interests um, as we had um, in the Khuzestan project. Khuzestan is the southern region in Iran that I just spoke of. Elsewhere in the book, he goes on to reflect on the significance of organic design in the desert or the ways in which desert spaces can act upon us. The point of reference in this assertion um, um, is an experience that Alan had in the summer of 1962 with an abandoned yet intact mosque near the city of Isfahan in the central deserts of Iran. He mentions a characteristic which he identifies as organic realism in architecture, one that has the power to transform us and act upon us. Alan's description indicates a characteristic in the brick and mortar of an old mosque at the edge of the Iranian central desert, which strikes a chord with what Khalili also saw in the desert architecture of Iran, a kind of organically grown and self-sustained architecture that can act upon us and shape our way of life. However, from its inception, the story of Biosphere 2 as you know, um, indicated otherwise. The management uh, became complicated. Later on, Steve Bannon took over, and the project um, uh, did not serve its original purpose, which was to be a sealed space and analog for the Mars or Moon. Over time, therefore, Biosphere 2 became all but an exhibition space and also a lab for biology majors at the University of Arizona. Um, um, and you can read about that. These are not my words. I'm paraphrasing from historian Natalie Koch, um, who has written a wonderful book um, uh, recently uh, called The Arid Empire. I have presented just a handful of examples from a vast array of alternative designers, experimental scientists, and visionaries who embraced or were influenced by organic design principles in arid regions. Beyond the settler colonial mindset, these designers, much like science fiction writers, aimed to devise sustainable solutions for Earth and potential outer space habitats. So where does Khalili's work fit in here. Earlier, I pointed out that many academics have labeled NASA's bold endeavors led by innovators like Gerard O'Neill as settler colonial. Similarly, North American alternative approaches have faced the same critiques, notably Solaris projects as well as Biosphere 2. Khalili, who passionately involved himself in translating and interpreting medieval Sufi worldviews and correlated Persian poetry, especially those of Rumi, managed to link his design concepts with his spiritual beliefs. In 1994, Khalili gathered all of his thoughts about lunar settlements in a book titled Sidewalks on the Moon, the journey of a mystic architect through tradition, technology, and transformation. The title itself attests to Khalili's interest in seeking ecological wisdom, reinventing the human and nurturing the emergence of a vibrant Earth community. Khalili's inclination to shape the design philosophy around Sufi thought was likely influenced, and I'm saying likely because I'm not sure of that yet, I have to do more research, by the ideas of the renowned Iranian Sufi philosopher Hussein Nasr, 
It's worth noting, noting that Nasser's influence extended to other architects of the same generation of Khalilis in Iran, including the authors of this monumental book published by the University of Chicago Press to commemorate the 2500 anniversary of the Persian Empire, an epic celebration sponsored by the Shah of Iran. To provide insight into Nasser's perspective, he offers in this book commentary on a modern sustainable project built in 1976 in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, and you can see that in the right of the slide. And he talks about it in these terms. Alternative forms of technology are to be welcomed and such institutions as the new Alchemy Institute of Cape Cod in America must be praised, but such feasts of science and engineering alone will not solve the problem. There is no choice but to bring to the fore the historical roots of the ecological crisis, which many refuse to take into consideration. I must add that the book was written in the 1960s, but it's in the prologue to the edition of the 1970s that he writes this. Beyond Nasser's possible influence, and perhaps more importantly, um, Khalili's interest in Sufism was in line with a broader global interest in his spirituality and its latent potential for offsetting the negative aspects of rigid industrialization. Soleri, who was um, uh, a devout follower of the ideas of the Jesuit priest and philosopher Pierre Tillard de Chardin, for example, sought what historian Larry Bosby in this book characterizes as the cult of therapy or a desert situated spiritual fulfillment through an ethno psychedelic escape into other higher states of awareness. Then again, we might situate Khalili's interest in spirituality and Sufism amid the global avant-garde design circles that frequently drew from various streams of transcendental mysticism, such as theosophy, Zen Buddhism, and Hinduism, to present a counterpoint to the technological ethos of industrial modernity. However, at its core, Khalili's search for spirituality is not a self-help strategy or a therapeutic this, this, this device, characteristics that scholars have aptly acknowledged concerning some aspects of Solaris projects in Arizona desert or other similar initiatives by contemporaneous countercultural designers such as the Ant Farm or Drop City. Curiously, even within the context of science fiction of the era, spiritual allegory also holds great prominence. Luke Skywalker's iconic family dwelling is notably reminiscent of the Marabou tombs strewn throughout Tunisia and North Africa. These maraboots were Sufi saints with some leading lives of itinerant asceticism. The term marabout is also employed to denote the mausoleums erected in honor of these religious figures. And today, a lot of these maraboots are damaged, and I was told that the Salafis actually don't like this um, approach, and therefore many of them are um, in a bad shape. Khalili's passion for spiritualism is quite the reverse, not grounded in his own pursuit of discovery in the world or escape from it. Neither it is rooted in some Orientalist fantasies of deviant saints. Rather, his spiritual inclination is in line with his desire to bring about a more humanitarian future in light of energy crisis, rising concerns about environmental problems, and even a conceivable apocalypse. More than a decade after Khalili's passing at the Cal Earth Institute, which is three hours outside of Los Angeles, if I'm not wrong, um, I've traveled there, but I, but I lost track of the hours that it takes to get there. He founded um, uh, uh, an institution uh, that one can still meet uh, uh, with humanitarians and activists, uh, some with no design or, back, uh, or art background, who come from faraway places to participate in the institute's workshops or to join the continuing educational programs and residencies. They come to learn Khalili's building methods and they enthusiastically take these skills back to their own devastated communities. While Khalili's ideas continue to surface in his memoirs and a few other 
publications, scientific as well as architectural, they were never realized. On the contrary, while O'Neill cylinders failed to be realized, they have continued to surface in popular imagination, um, uh, uh, including the movie Interstellar, uh, and even playing a central role in architectural history books. Whether they criticize it or not, that's besides the point, but I'm saying that it's highlighted constantly in the literature. Yet, um, we passed you know, the 50th anniversaries of Apollo 11 landing in 2019. Um, so it, after, after that, it becomes evident that Nader Khalidi's visionary ideas um, uh, hold even greater relevance today. Institutions like NASA and ESA, as well as powerful individuals um, like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are actively pursuing 3D printing technology to construct lunar bases using lunar regolith, echoing Khalili's lunar building methods from decades ago. In conclusion, to truly decentralize and even decolonize survival narratives, we must revisit often overlooked chapters in the story of survival through design. This includes the colonization of space and the resilience against both natural and human-made catastrophes on Earth. Design plays a pivotal role in these narratives, addressing technical and pragmatic aspects while nurturing aspirational and utopian dreams. In this book, and many more journalistic writings that have surfaced in the media recently, we learn that for the tech billionaires, the future of technology is about only one thing, escaping from the rest of us. Contrary to the approach of the tech billionaires who seek to escape from the world, true survival lies in models like those proposed by Khalidi, which has extended to hundreds of followers in Iran, including the Sfak Mod Group, led by architect Pouya Khazaeli Parsa, which is enhancing traditional building methods for greater resilience against environmental disasters. These examples highlight narratives of resilience that sharply contrast with pretentious construction projects, which often resemble empty vestiges of futuristic designs prevalent during the Cold War, the time period whose alternative visions were later overshadowed by the rise of neoliberalism. Notable instances include the desert resorts in Iran promoted as outer space settlements and the geodesic tourist domes all over the Middle East, including in Wadi Rum, as well as Master City in Dubai, which have fallen short of their premise of achieving uh, zero net energy usage. By uncovering the neglected segments of the history of survival by design, my hope in this still ongoing research is to deepen and reevaluate our understanding of survival by design, but also to acknowledge the Middle East's and North Africa's geopolitical role in the past and present sustainable and apocalyptic design discourses. Lastly, highlighting Nader Khalidi's story isn't just about decentralizing these kinds of survival narratives that belong to the super rich, or rather about liberating my own mind and psyche as an Iranian American, and I'm referring to decolonization um, in terms of what Franz Fanon uh, told us, or offering an, an alternative perspective for the sake of offering an alternative perspective. For me, this study is above all about decolonizing in the specific sense of the term as a verb, not a noun, one that embraces diverse epistemologies, references, and paths to redefine conventional survival narratives, but also one that is an ongoing process, more than a lifetime, like that of Khalili's. Thank you so much.